Um, on the right is Tom Seeley, who, um, as most of you know, flew in from uh, uh, Detroit very early this morning. He's already given one lecture. He's been keeping bees just short of 50 years. Next to him is Peter Jenkins from uh, Cardigan. Um, he followed his father as a beekeeper, his father, uh, 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 Griff Jenkins, and um, he's now uh, keeping it uh, on. So he's been keeping bees over 50 years. And next is uh, Meg Seymour, who is a seasonal bee inspector. Uh, she also followed her father uh, into beekeeping, and uh, she's been keeping bees around about 25 years. So we've got Prada, Prada, um, uh, quite an experienced uh, panel. And if they don't know anything, I'll chip in. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought you'd get that one. And, um, well, the trouble is I haven't got Nelly to help me out. Um, and uh, I've only been keeping bees 54 years, but I'll rely on these as much, much as I can. Uh, so please, it's the questions that you want uh, answered, the sort of things that might have hit you this year that you think, well, hang on, what's going on here? Or um, just um, any general questions. Um, so please, please, please don't keep asking questions about Tom Seeley's uh, presentation, otherwise the other two won't get a, a look in. So first question, please. Yeah. Uh, with such a distinguished panel, could you tell us what we can learn from what we see outside the hive? So, right, so basic lessons. observation before you, yes. uh, before, before you get there. Yes, um, your weekly inspections or 10-day inspections, I think three quarters or half of three quarters of what you can do before you even open the hive. You can see if they're cutting pollen in and, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you, you, you can tell a lot. Is the hive healthy and uh, are, they, are they busy? Are they, are they cutting in pollen? There's all sorts of things you can tell from looking outside the hive before you even open it. You know, it's, I don't know. What, what, else, what else, as an inspector, what did you say? Yeah, well, that's okay, I've got my own. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll add in uh, that very much you can see the, the pattern of behavior of the bees outside, so you can see whether they're robbing or not. So by the way the other bees on the entrance are attending to them, are they being very defensive, that kind of thing. Um, later on in the season you can see whether you've got other entrances that you didn't intend to have because you can also see whether wasps are going in and out somewhere and that, that sort of thing. Um, also, not just visual of having a look, but use your sense of smell. You can tell what they're bringing in. Um, yeah, because you know, okay, admittedly with some things, as soon as you lift the lid, you can tell before you've delved in any further are they working heather? Are they working oilseed rape? Something like that. Yeah, hopefully you can all pick up those differences in, in scents. And that would also tell you, to a certain extent, whether or not you've got foul brood. If you've got foul brood quite badly, you can smell it before you go in. So, shall I pause at that point? Tom? Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'd add to that is there's a really nice little book written on this by Storch, S-T-O-R-C-H, Observations at the Hive Entrance, I think is the title. It's a really good book, and it's, yeah, I agree. You can learn, so, you can tell a lot about the health and vigor of the colony just by looking at the entrance. And that was his main point. He was saying, it always is a disturbance to a colony to open it up and pull the frames out. A lot of your questions about the state of the colony can be addressed just by making careful observations at the entrance. Um, I shouldn't really chip in, I know, but um, uh, I've, I've been to the States now twice the last two years, and the first time um, we got out of the truck at a, uh, an apiary with about 35 colonies, and the truck was about from here to that bar away. And I said to the person whose bees they were, I said, there's a problem with this lot, uh, and it was a bright sunny day, and the bees were, you know, should have been flying. And um, when we got up to the uh, front of the hives, there were a lot of bees on the front of the hive, all with black shiny bodies and it was chronic bee paralysis virus, and they didn't know uh, anything about it. So, you know, if you see bees hanging on the front of a hive, um, you'll, um, you'll, you'll notice a problem. So all sorts of things like that. So, um, everybody okay with that one? Take one uh, down here. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, on the subject of bees' behavior outside the hive, several years in a row, I've observed my bees doing what looks like hoovering, 
backwards and forwards. I've heard it described as washboarding, and I've no idea why they do it. They're healthy bees, but they're just clustered on the front of the hive and moving up and down, moving up and down in small movements. Any idea what that's about? Tom. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have the first go at this. At the end, the, curiously, we know surprisingly little about that. If you, we can describe the behavior, you can look at them rocking back and forth, you can see that they're move, you, uh, going over the surfaces with their mandibles and their forelegs, but whether they're applying some material, whether it, how much it's really planing down the surface, whether it's part of cleaning, the, we, we see in nature that uh, around a knot hole of an entrance that they will have smoothed that area to make, maybe to make it easier to come and go, and they've put propolis over there. Um, but exactly what they're doing, to my knowledge, nobody's really investigated it adequately. Meg, do you want to crack at that? I'll, I'll just add one thing in, which is obviously in the feet of the bees, they've got scent glands. So at any surface that they're walking over, and it, particularly if they're, they're on it quite a lot, it's going to uh, be, be scent marking. So it'll be much more familiar for the, the other bees coming back to the hive as to this is, this is you know, where home is and, and maybe guiding them into the entrance. But beyond that, I'm with Tom. We don't know very much about it at all. Yeah. Perhaps I'd better point out at this, uh, this stage that Meg, being a bee inspector, of course she's going around, she's seen a lot of different bees, a lot of different beekeepers, a lot of different districts and that sort of thing. So she's really in a good place to see any variations. Do you want to add to that, um, Peter? I've got nothing to add to that. Um, no. The more we learn about bees, the more we realise the little we know. I think is the only thing I can add to that. Right. Um, yeah, just... Um, yeah, oh, OK, we'll take one on the back. All right. Um, this does relate to Tom's lecture earlier, but it's just a quickie. Um, how do they do the beep? How, how do they make the sound? Yeah, the question was how do they make the beep sound? They um, contract their flight muscles. So it's, uh, and then they're vibrating their wings in, in doing so. Uh, it's, a, it's a sound that they also make while they're doing the... Um, Yeah, there, there are other contexts where they're um, making sounds. Uh, during the waggle dance, for example, there's also some wing movements like that. So, and they're all produced with the flight muscles, loading, making sound go into the air by vibrating the wings. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, just going back to swarm, standing up. Just going back to um, swarming and your honeybee democracy book. Um, Richard and I picked up a swarm um, last week, sitting in a tree, drawn nice four combs of, um, or about 12 inches down, eight inches down, and they'd obviously been there a while, therefore. At what point do bees give up trying to find a new home then? Because this was on an exposed branch, not a particularly sheltered place. Um, you know, at what point, again, reading your book, they send out the scouts, they find the best location, they come back. At what point do they suddenly decide, well, we're going to give up and we're going to make our home where it is, as opposed to, and how, you know, how many colonies do actually, that swarm, actually, do they give up trying to find a home? It was very interesting just wondering, you know, what point do bees give up, basically? Next question, please. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you, you've, you've asked another really hard question. <laughs> Washboarding, why do they nest out in the open? Um, I, I don't know. It's pretty clearly it's a mistake on their part. What I can say is that if, you, if they start building a little comb and the queen lays some eggs, that bit of brood really locks them in there. But it's clearly a mistake. And so it's, it's a real mystery why they, why they make such a fatal error. Because you, in your book you talk about the democracy and they go out and everything else and come back and, and, and how that all works. Are you saying, but at what point do the, you know, the scouts just give up? Have you, have, you, have you done any trials to see at what point they just give up when you can't, when you don't, on that oh. island, if you don't give them any nesting place, at what point do they just say, we're giving up? Oh, thank you for putting it in those terms. I've never, ever seen that phenomenon occur on the island. Um, they will just keep going, which makes me think that there's something else going on, that there, maybe the, 
you know, they tried to move, maybe the queen didn't fly. I, I don't know. I, it's, a, it's yet another, as, as Peter said, there's just so many mysteries about the bees, and, and that's certainly one. But I know people have done experiments. You can stabilize a swarm into, an in, one, into one of those interim sites by putting just a little bit of comb with brood in it. Um, and I think that does arise in nature, not just in experiments. Well, I think the question like this is a danger in um, us humanising bees. You know, why are they doing this or why are they doing that? Um, I think the answer is probably that we don't know. Um, but I've known of ever so many wild colonies that are built you know, literally in, uh, in the branches and they, they, the, I've never known one survive yet. In fact, I've never let ne known one get past the end of the year. So it, it just doesn't make sense. Peter, you want if to I, crack it just chip it. If I can just chip in there, it's, it probably comes back to Darwinism. I mean, bees have been on the planet for millions of years before man, and it was probably half the swarms that swarmed every season probably died, it didn't survive the winter. And that sort of filtered them out. And, and bees, will, they will look for a cavity that they can defend, a letterbox or a, or a, or a church tower or, or, or a hollow tree or whatever, but there will be a large fraction of them. I mean, as, as Roger said, we're humanizing them. You know, we can't humanize them. In nature, they, a lot of them would have died off. You know, so they work by instinct. There's thousands of them in a hive, but they work by collective instinct. They, they have very strong instincts built into them, but, and they've got what we call a hive mind. But once those scouts have gone out and, and they fail to find somewhere that they can defend, I mean, you see, quite often see them in pillar boxes, and they couldn't really defend that come the winter, could they? Really? Cast iron cold box. Uh, but there we are. So. Just, uh, just a quick question, Meg, as a bee inspector, uh, are they technically termed as an apiary? <laughs> uh, yeah, technically, technically it, it is a colony of bees. So, um, you know, if that was in your garden and you decided that you wanted to leave them there and see what happened to them, if we came and inspected the other colonies in your apiary and found that you had a problem, we would want to uh, look at those combs. So they would have to be transferred into something at some point. Um, as a very new beekeeper, um, the thing about asking one question and getting five answers, um, desperate to, for my mistakes, not to be the demise of my bees, uh, overwintering insulating, not insulating, ventilating, not ventilating, <laughs> open, open mesh board, closed mesh board. I'll be honest, I'm really confused and concerned. <laughs> I've got about 20, 20 answers to the overwintering well, thing. Get a hundred colonies and do a hundred different things and then you'll have an answer. Um, Meg, do you want to crack at that one? Yeah, okay. Um, my, I, I have three rules, okay, which when I'm talking to people who are starting beekeeping like yourself and, you know, <coughs> and that these rules will work for everybody in the room, however you keep your bees. One is how long it takes from an egg to a larvae to hatching out, you know, that's slightly different for workers, queens and drones. That's a rule and that's a biological rule. The other one is bee space. We know that if it's too small, they block it up. Uh, you know, they propolize it. If it's too big, they'll build brace comb. That's another rule. The third rule is if you think you have a notifiable pest or disease, you have to tell us, okay? So those are the three rules. However you decide to keep your bees apart from those rules is entirely up to you. Now, if somebody in your association, group, on the internet, whatever, says, you must do it like this, and you must do it like that, and you must not do this, and you should do the other, it's not a rule, it's not illegal, okay? Now, if you, if you put your bees so that the flight path is immediately, you know, through the fence into your next door neighbour's back garden, then you might get into a legal situation with the local council and your neighbours and everything else. So that, you might have some other rules there. But essentially, okay, that, so that's where I come from for starters. Now, to answer your questions a bit more, open mesh floors, people are going to say yes, no, whatever. If you've got a mesh floor, the whole point about having a mesh floor is that if the bees are grooming and they groom off any live mites, that they fall down through the floor and out of the hive. 
Now, if they're falling down onto uh, a board that you've put in, they're going to crawl back around and come back up again because it's too close. <coughs> if that board is left in all the way through the winter, all the other bits are going to fall on it, and it is going to be a lovely place for wax moth. Okay? So, if you've got mesh floors, I would leave the drawers out for the winter time for, for those reasons. If you don't want them to be on a mesh floor, put them on a solid floor. Okay? But there's no right or wrong there. What I do personally is I have mine on mesh floors and I leave them open for the winter time. Now, this is where you get all sorts of arguments. In the past, people would have had, a lot of people would have had solid floors and they all put matchsticks under the crown board for added ventilation, yeah? How many people still do that? Okay, we just got a few hands going up. How many people have crown boards with feeder holes in? Which is pretty much everybody. Not very many people have what I'd call a solid crown board with no feeder holes in. What have I just said they're called? Feeder holes for feeding. Personally, and again, this is me, and I'm just sort of throwing it out there a bit, I cover them. Because when I am not feeding, I do not want to be a chimney through my hive, okay? In your house, if you have a loft, you insulate it. I insulate my roofs. And I don't leave the loft hatch open at home, okay? Because I don't want any of the warmth from the house to go up into that loft bit. I want it to stay in the house. The bees are clustering in the winter time if they're staying, relatively speaking, warm and dry, you know, warm by their own warmth, but dry, if the, if the crown board and above it is insulated, then any condensation is more likely to happen on the side walls of the hive so they can recycle the water, but it's not dripping onto their heads. So they're not, you're not getting that sort of internal damp problem. There you go. That's, that's my two penny worth. But you'd have to make your own mind up. And if, as I say, if somebody is saying you've got to do it like this and somebody else is saying you must do it like that... It was natural to me. Yeah. I tend to do things by a certain amount of logic and a certain amount of thinking, well, if it was a colony in a tree, they would have a small entrance hole that they would be able to defend very easily. If it was a bigger hole, they're more likely to propolize it up in the winter time and open it up in the summer time when they've got really want to be coming and going. Um, and a tree is a huge amount of insulation. So, as I say, you'll all probably have all sorts of different arguments about that one, but... This is, this is one issue that we've got um, in beekeeping because there's loads of different uh, variables, uh, one of which is uh, uh, Peter Jenkins, because he's in... He lives in quite harsh conditions in Wales, so you, 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 you have a crack, Peter. What, what, what do you do? Yeah. Do you want to stand up? Mo yeah. Most of the hives these days, they've got a tin roof, right? And the one thing that'll kill your bees is condensation, okay? So the, as it as it said, been said previously, the, the hot air rises, but it's hot, moist air. So the worst thing that can happen, it'll go straight up through the feeder roll and condense on the tin roof and drip back down on top of the bees. That'll kill your bees. So block your feeder roll, that's what I do. I put a bit of carpet over the top so there's insulation between the tin and the bees. So any condensation then will be on the walls of the hive and run down or, or be recycled or whatever. Okay. Right. I, I want to um, <clears throat> chime in with what Meg's, Meg was advocating. Um, uh, but I also want to add the <coughs> fact that I really liked, I think one of my rules is I think the bees are the best beekeepers. <laughs> and you know, we've probably all seen that come fall and early winter, the bees are propolizing, sealing up all those top openings, getting that top, that top of, of, their, of our hives as tight as they can. So I think their bees are telling us, we don't want a top entrance. The other thing I would add is, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, I guess it is when I talk about water, the water economy of colonies. The thirstiest honeybees I've ever seen are bees in the winter. And they were, hap they were living in one of my ops hives in a warm room where there wasn't condensation. 
And the reason I know those bees were exceedingly thirsty is because when we got a January thaw, bees went out to the parking lot where on the black pavement the snow was melting and they were collecting water. And I've looked at a lot of waggle dances in my life and there was a bee that were, bees were coming in doing waggle dances with over 400 dance circuits in them. They were so excited to get that water. So having that top tight is not only good for, so the heat doesn't go out, and there's some interesting papers on that now, but also um, for keeping that upper part warm. And then there is condensation, which is evidently the bees' winter water supply. Bees need water year round, and that, so some condensation is, it can be useful, it is useful to the bees, in my experience. Right, yeah, um, I'm a great believer in, uh, if you do something different, do it on half your colonies. And uh, when open mesh floors first came in, uh, we, were, we were told by everyone that you must close them off during the winter, otherwise the bees would, would, would rise to the top and you'd end up with small colonies uh, in the spring. That's what we're all told. Um, they didn't take any notice of the fact that the Americans have been doing it uh, for years and years and years. And they just call them screen bottom boards. So I had 18 colonies at the time. And of course, I, I thought, well, hang on, the bees are, yeah, there might be something in this. So I, I left nine on solid floors and put nine on um, completely open, open mesh floors. In the spring, I didn't get the result I wanted. What I found was, oh, well, I, I, I didn't tell you, that I sort of evened the colonies out. So they're roughly two equal groups. Um, what I found out in the spring wasn't what, what I expected. Um, the colonies both came through roughly the same um, uh, uh, stage, but what I found was those on the open mesh floors had very much less chalk brood than those on the solid floors, tending to suggest to me that um, uh, you know, they, they do need some sort of uh, ventilation. So um, you know, if you do something, I suggest strongly that you try, try it on half your colonies and see what happens. Next question, please. Uh, hello, uh, so we are French beekeepers and we have uh, since a few years a problem with the um, Asian hornet, you know, I think you've heard about it. And uh, <laughs> So that's where they came from, was it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and I was wondering if, because uh, we, we have, we see them every day, the Asian hornets in front of the beehives turning and getting bees flying away, coming back for new bees. And we see how much it, it stresses the bees out because they cluster around the entrance hole. And uh, I was wondering if you think that um, somehow they will adapt and be able to defend against this new predator? Well, Meg's been chasing them for the last few weeks. Do you want to have a crack on this one? Uh, it's probably not really, it's probably more of a, a, a Tom thing because it's a behavior of the bees that um, whether they will adapt, you know, in our lifetimes, possibly not. In, in, you know, the big scheme of things of evolution, then hopefully yes, but as humans, we're too bad at moving things around the world you know, as you probably know, the ones in France came from one mated queen that came in over the winter of 2003-2004, um, and, and it's now throughout France. And the, the two nests that have been on the mainland UK in the last two years have also been linked to the French ones. So, you know, at some point, hibernating queens or whatever have you know, ended up over here in some way, shape, or form. I don't think in the short term they're going to adapt. Is So it's really up to us as beekeepers to do what we can to help the bees get in and out of the hives okay. Um, I know there are various things that people can add to their floors. One of them is... Um, uh, a series of rows of like pins, as I understand it, which means that when you get to the point of the horn, it's actually coming right down to the entrances rather than picking the bees off as they come back into the hive, because that's what they're generally doing to start with until the colony is quite weakened, then they will actually really go into the hives. Um, but those pins are set at a distance, and I can't tell you what that distance is off the top of my head, sorry, uh, because the, the Asian hornets, are really uh, want to look after their wings 
and they don't like to tip in to go, so they want to keep their wings out like that. They're not very good at doing that. So as long as your entrances uh, have got this sort of extra bit that is just under the width of their wings, you're going to keep them off that bit. And it means you can keep the landing board, the bees can be on the landing board and actually have a better look out. And when they're coming back in, they can zip in, land on the landing board, and then go into the entrance a, a little bit more safely. But behaviour-wise, mm -hmm. are Tom, they going to learn? I don't know. Tom, do you think that they will uh, modify? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it'll be learning. It'll be natural selection for colonies that have it. The Asian Apis serrana is really good at dealing with these Asian hornets. And what they do is they retreat inside the nest. And when the hornet goes and pursues into the nest to a, pursue its attack, then they ball it and kill it with the, with the, by cooking the, the hornet. Um, sorry, Tom, is that, um, sorry, just stand up again. Tom, is that a, a mandarina or the, it, what we're referring to as the Asian hornet? It, yeah, that, it's, it's different species of Vespa. There's, in Japan and northern China, there's mandarina, Vespa mandarina. Down in the Thailand, there's tropica um, and volutina and, and others. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I'm deal to you here, but I thought it was only mandarina that they bawled and not velutina, which is the one that we've got in France. So just in terms of, the, of what they're doing yeah, there. I, 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 know know. They'll, I know they'll, it's not just mandarina that gets bawled by Apis serrana. Okay. So, yeah. Um, it, may, it probably will take a while, <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see whether there is that variation in Apis mellifera, our European Apis mellifera. Uh, yeah, time will tell. I guess, I hope so. I, I, I'm optimistic. Okay, one at the back. Um, Sorry, can we just clarify where the pins go? Sorry, yeah, uh, the question um, for oh, me. Uh, sorry, yes, it's, so basically you, you build a little kind of front section that, that goes onto the front of the hive. So ideally you want to have a landing board as well and then it covers the whole front area so that the hornets cannot get in and cannot fly and land on the, uh, you know, on the entrance because these pins are positioned all the way along that front bit and, and then it's sort of blocked off on the end. So, so like a mouse card, I Yeah, sort of like a mouse card but further forward so that you've got, you know, got it a couple of inches out. So it's like a little sort of oblong box with pins all the way along the front. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, chronic bee paralysis virus. Um, last year I had a um, colony came out of winter, built up really strongly. Um, all of my colonies are trapped the same way for Varroa through the winter months. Um, so this colony had built up to uh, double brood, three supers, and then it just suffered a, a massive attack of um, bee paralysis virus. Um, that resulted basically in the, in the colony dwindling over a period of about four months to about two frames of bees in a nuke, which eventually I, I just allowed them to go that way as an experiment to see what the outcome would be, um, whether allowing nature to take its course was the best way forward. Um, so consequently, as far as I know, there's no veterinary medicines available to treat it. Um, what would be the best way to try and help a, a colony survive um, a virus load such as that? Yeah, go on in, mate. Sorry, starting up again. Um, okay, uh, their uh, research project has just been uh, begun this year at uh, Ferra. And as inspectors, we are now starting to collect samples. So we should actually find out a little bit more about the virus. So if you, know, you do have it, so this is to everybody, if you do have a problem next year, contact your local bee inspector. Um, and then you might well get involved in this uh, research project. Um, but one of the things that has been put forward as really not helping much with this virus, I mean, you mentioned the fact that you keep your varroa numbers down, which is great, because that's definitely one way that viruses are spread. 
Um, but you also said it built up, it was double brood box colony, really quite strong, and then showed the symptoms. Um, what is thought is that when there's not that much space in the hive, so in other words, when you've got something which is building up and is, is you know, possibly being a little bit crowded at a point before the next box is put on, that that contact, you know, B2B contact is a very good way of passing the virus around as well. So, you know, that's where if they've got it a bit, they're likely to get it more. Now, in terms of treatment, there isn't anything medically that you can give them. So there's no, um, no medical treatment, no um, veterinary medicine for it. What we have been suggesting to people, and it's worked with some people, but not with others, and I think it depends how bad the, uh, the virus is, you know, when somebody decides to do something about it. Um, but is, uh, and this sounds somewhat bizarre, but they're actually, all the bees are thrown up in the air and I'm just trying to remember how far away you do it from the hive. But you, you basically, you throw them all out and I think you take them at 20, 30 feet away and I'm really sorry that I can't remember, I have to double check that. Um, so the, and, then, and then you put the hive back together again and the idea is that you're actually getting rid of a lot of those ones with the virus, okay, and that, that you're keeping behind the ones which are healthier and that when the new brood emerges, that hopefully then they, you know, there are not so many infected bees around, so they're less likely to pick it up. Um, and that has worked well for some people, but it hasn't worked for others, and they've still dwindled. So, you know, that's the only thing at the moment. There's cool. a hand up there, which may be a supplementary question. Yes, do you... Know yes, you reuse, reuse the same comb. Basically, if you... If you with um, chronic bee paralysis virus, you get a lot of bees that, that die in the hive and, you know, outside. So uh, what you're trying to do is get rid of those bees further away so that they're not then hanging around and then dying in the vicinity, you know, of everybody, everybody else. Every, we're um, <laughs> anthropomorphizing again, but with all the other bees. So the idea is that you're trying to reduce the virus load of the whole colony in the hope then that, that you know, the, the, as the bees emerge, they might not pick it up so easily. Enforced hygienic behavior by the beekeeper, yeah. yeah. Tom, do you want to have a crack at that? Um, I don't really have a good suggestion. I might give the colony um, a frame of um, emerging brood just to bolster it, and maybe that'll help it overcome the virus infection. It, it, um, I just, I don't have experience with that problem, so yeah. I, I don't, can't say really. Yeah. Um, Peter, is that a problem, Wiles? Not that I've noticed. I think the one important key is to keep the varroa as low as possible. Um, I no longer use sticky boards to do varroa counts. I do the alcohol shake now because it's more accurate. And I think uh, the bees, are, if anything, they're less tolerant of varroa than they used to be. Uh, but uh, I think varroa is a big key factor in colony losses as far as in our area anyway. We get people moving in, uh, retiring to the area, thinking they've got to read the Sunday Sunday, Sunday <coughs> magazines and they're going to do something for the bees and then they buy two colonies of bees uh, with imported queens and then six, six months later they don't look after them and they become varroa bombs and I'm afraid and that's all too common. Okay. Hello. My question is, is, is keeping, are we hiding some of the behaviours of bees by keeping them in the hives we put them in compared to what they would be in trees? This is sort of inspired by the Asian hornet, does Apis mellifera actually have a behaviour to defend itself, but it's being masked perhaps by the fact of the hives we're putting them in? Because if you consider a tree, that's a long, thin tunnel. Perhaps the, um, <coughs> our honeybees have actually got a way of dealing with um, other predators, including perhaps Asian hornet, because of the things they've learned while they were in trees, and yet we're looking at them in hives. What you've got to do is come along to a presentation on Saturday afternoon, and then you might, we might get the answer on that one. Um, so anyway, uh, Peter, do you want to crack at that one? I think if you want to manage bees successfully, you've got to, you've got to put, house them 
in as near as natural conditions as possible. To the bee, the bee doesn't realize it's a hive. The bee thinks it's just another hollow tree cavity that it can defend. And uh, they naturally store the honey above the brood, and that's by adding supers and so on. And we, we, we uh, not, don't trick them, but we, we encourage them to go the way we want them to go. They, they, don't, they don't know us. They're still wild animals, essentially. But we just breed them to do what we want to do, and we manage them to do what we want to do <laughs> by uh, giving them a cavity that they think is a hollow tree. So I don't know. Tom, I'll come to you last because um, um, you've done a little bit of study on this. Do you want to crack at that, Meg? Um, yeah, I was just thinking of answering from the point of view of the Asian hornet. And the Asian hornet doesn't just ad attack the hives and pick the bees off as they're coming back to the hives or, or even in the hive once it's actually, you know, on a really low spirits. But they will pick off honeybees and other insects when they're out foraging. So it, 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 Therefore, the natural behavior of the bee uh, in, in its home isn't really going to be affected, if, if that makes some sort of sense, or not by, you know, the, the Asian hornet is still going to be able to go out there and pick the bees off outside of the hive. That was the point I wanted to make, really. That's it. Tom? Yeah, it's, rich, it's a rich topic you ask. Um, there's a couple of things, and I will talk more about it on Saturday. Um, three things that are really hugely different that uh, where we create a, an odd situation for the bees when we have them in our hives. One, we put them in really large nest cavities so they don't, don't swarm very much. Secondly, we put them in the cavities that have smooth surfaces so they don't coat the, the interiors with propolis, which isn't very, which is help, which normally is, is there and it actually reduces their uh, disease stress loads. Um, and then the third thing we do is we put them close together and that really facilitates the spread of diseases and parasites. So there's a lot of things. It's a great topic and it's, a, it's something we... Um, I'll talk about more on Saturday and I, I hope we'll have a good discussion about it then too. apologize but I'm going back a bit um, and it's more of a supplementary answer perhaps than a question uh, about the fact that the bees uh, build wild comb in trees. It has been suggested, I can't remember by whom, uh, that it is regressive behavior in that uh, bees in Africa, uh, they will set up a home in a tree and when the forage in that particular area dries up they just move on to another foraging area. I don't know if you have any comments on that. It, it, it was a question about whether it's re regressive behaviour, um, bees building nest out in the open. Any views? I'll, I'll have a little view. <laughs> um, the lady mentioned that bees in Africa, you know, set up a home in, in one area and then when the forage is gone, they move. The, the, the thing is, the climate's very, very different, and that's one big thing that we need to remember about how we keep our bees in, you know, these climates rather than, you know, African climates where you're perhaps tropical or subtropical. You know, the temperatures are different, the forage is different, so the behavior is going to be different. Um, that's my comment on that bit, really, and I'll leave Tom to go about the rest of home and trees. I don't know if it's regressive or not, um, though there, you do see that behavior in um, other races of the honeybee. I think it's a mistake, and I think it's a fatal mistake, and I think it's a good example of selection. The genes that, under, that give rise to that behavior are, are taken out, so that's just, that's just life. <laughs> not, not everything is, not all colonies are made equal <laughs> and are equally adaptive. Yeah. Okay, and there were some further Brought it back, uh, Oliver. Hello. Um, I would like to ask, uh, how are wild bees doing against furore now? Is it, are we in a situation where there is improvement, or is it still in decline? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you presumably mean in a wild place where the bee has actually selected a nest themselves. So it could be a chimney or a, a walk. Wall cavity or a tree. Yep, okay. 
Okay. Well, can't, they're actually coming from three different areas. Really. <laughs> I'll, I'll attempt to answer. I would, you know, I'm doing a bit of a bit of a guess, but a bit of experience is that generally the beekeepers that I come across, well, sorry, the, the people who used to keep bees that I come across that still have some kind of container with bees in, okay? <laughs> because they're not beekeepers anymore, are they? They're not doing anything. Um, generally speaking, if there are still bees in those containers and they've not done anything for, say, five years, I, and I can't swear to this because obviously they've not looked, I've not looked, nobody else has looked. But from what you can see in terms of looking at the comb and seeing how much has been, say, eaten away by wax moth and then you've got new comb in there, that those original colonies have died and other, other bees have swarmed in. In some circumstances, I've looked into colonies that have not been treated for several years, and they're still going, and they're okay-ish. So I will get there, don't worry. Um, other ones, I've looked in, again, where somebody hasn't for a while, they've died, and you can see that they've died of varroa-related issues. So you can see you know, deformed wings and stunted bees and things like that. Now, if that's what's happening in those uh, abandoned bees, to my mind, that is pretty much the same as a swarm going into a tree or a chimney or whatever. It's not being treated. So what you've got in, a, in an old hive of something which isn't being treated is the equivalent of what you've got in your tree, chimney, wherever it happens to be. Some of them are managing better than others. And I think if the area generally has a low virus level, which you know happens in some areas better than others, then those bees are more likely to be surviving. Now I know that near me, there are places that, uh, there are colonies that people say have been in somebody's chimney or been in an old wall for a long time. I also know that they swarm very regularly. I do have my suspicions as to whether it's the original bees, and I think on the whole they're not. So I don't think they're coping with Varroa particularly well. It's in, in the UK where we have a lot of beekeepers per square mile, you know, where you are, you've probably got where there aren't quite as many but that's going to be very different again to where Tom comes from, where you know, you've got a lot more space. I think we have a lot of bees in generally not a big area, and it's inevitable that they're going to pick grow up from one another. So, Peter, what, what's it like in your area of Wales? Uh, up to three years ago, the varroa had ebbed quite a lot. We, 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 I only treat, I monitor conscientiously and I treat as necessary and up to three years ago the varroa was in decline it was less and less treatment need needed but in the last couple of years it's been a resurgence of varroa I don't know why I think we've had a couple of very mild winters where we maybe we haven't had brood breaks over the winter but varroa last year and particularly this year is a problem and I'll, I'll go along with what was said earlier Colonies that I've been told, or somebody's had a, somebody died 30 years ago and a hive is still in the garden and his bees been in there all the time, that's nonsense. Uh, you, you, you go along and you will find three or four combs underneath the roof of a WBC hive, rats in the bottom and, and, and rubbish in between, right? And they, they last year swarm. A swarm will have come in there from somewhere and maybe survived winter, maybe not, and that might have happened several times. So it's not the original same bees. Would you agree with that? Tom, you get involved with a lot of wild trying colonies. To be polite, but generally, yes. <laughs> I think I come from a have a real different situation because the ecology is really different in the northeastern United States. We've got vast forest areas which are filled with wild colonies of honeybees. This is the main focus of my research now. I'll talk about it on Saturday. In that, in that situation, there are populations where the whole population is exposed to natural selection. And so thus is very different from your situation here. In those 
in those bee colonies, those colonies are doing well now. They're doing as well. They're living and with colony survivorship is the same level as that we had before Varroa. I know that because I took data in the 70s on how long colonies, uh, their survivorship and their, their uh, lifespan. It's the same now as it was in the 70s, which was before Varroa. We also now know now that these bees in the wild went through a massive bout of natural selection. They went through a real genetic bottleneck. Probably the population was, our estimates are that it, based on the mitochondrial DNA patterns, they lost 90% of their genetic diversity, but they've rebuilt from that. We know looking at the uh, nuclear DNA that there are 282 genes that have undergone huge change. Not so much change, it wasn't by genetic drift, it was, must have been by selection. And phenotypically, we know that the bees are smaller than they were um, in the 1970s. We know that the bees are, they have behaviors now that they probably, we don't know if they had these behaviors in the 70s, but it's unlikely. They're very good at biting the legs off of varroa mites. Um, and they are also very good at um, VSH behavior. They will remove within 24 hours uh, 97 percent of the cells that have larvae with varroa in them. So these bees are really, they have a lot going for them against fighting varroa. So, and these are European honeybees. If you look at their, their um, racial composition, they are uh, 30 percent Ligustica, Italian, they're 30 percent Carniolan, they're 20 percent mellifera, Apis mellifera mellifera, and then the last 20 percent is um, is Caucasica. Those were the four big races introduced to North America. So these are really hybrid bees, but they're all European bees. There's, there's like one percent, there's one, one tiny fraction of a percent of African stock in these bees, and that, that has probably come in because beekeepers are sent bees from the southern United States, and those genes are getting in a little bit into the wild population. So I bet... <laughs> You may think I'm you know, bonkers, but I bet if you just, everybody here stopped treating bees for a, in a few years, your, your population would crash, but the bees that would still be around would be dealing with Varroa just fine, all on their own. So, but because I think that's what, that's what happened unintentionally in, in, this, in these populations out in the forests um, outside of Ithaca, New York. Is there any evidence that the uh, colonies are getting smaller that are dealing with Varroa better? Um, I can't say. Um, I, do know, I don't know if they're getting smaller. They are smaller colonies, and that's a good point. They're smaller colonies living in these tree cavities than they are in our hives. They're, they're typical tree cavity size, and I'll again talk about this on, I guess it's Saturday, um, is about one deep Langstroth hive body. They're swarming every year, and that swarming's really valuable. I, 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 I keep colonies, I keep, I keep some colonies from making honey, so they get supered up. But I've got a whole other bunch of colonies that I sprinkle around the countryside in movable frame equipment in one deep hive body. I call them my simulated wild colonies. And I know, um, I know that the colonies that swarm, that really knocks, and I monitor them every May, July, and September. I keep the queens marked so I can tell whether there's been a queen turnover or not. And yeah, the colonies that have had the same queen all summer long, hence didn't swarm, they have higher mite levels um, than the ones that, that ha have had a queen change probably through swarming. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool stuff going on when bees get to live as, in the way they want to live. Go on down the back. Oh, yeah. uh, good morning. Um, uh, there's another pest question. Our hearts go back to the French with regards to the uh, Asian hornet and we've all seen the figures of the average honey yield plummeting because of it. The other thing that we've got that's terrifying us at the moment is, of course, the advent of small hive beetle. And while this country tolerates the import of not only queens but package bees, we're going to get it. Does the team think that when we get it, and if it gets rampant, is it going to clean out our industry, as Akrine did at the beginning of the century? Or is it something that we can learn to live with and indeed continue to prosper. Um, I'll, I'll have a first stab at that because we have had to deal exactly with the situation you raised. What happens when small hive beetle comes in? People learn to live with it, but it's a real pain in the butt 
Um, and, and it's the biggest problem that we have. It's changed dramatically how beekeepers harvest their honey. They used to be able to take their honey off, put it in a warm room for a day or two to warm up the honey, and then extract it, spin out nicely. You can't do that now. And within 48 hours, small hive beetle will be just destroying your, the, your honeycombs. They're very, it's just amazing, their rate of reproduction of the tiny little larvae and how much damage they do. Um, so yeah, I, if you can, boy, I would do whatever you can to keep small hive beetle out of the UK and just stop importing or whatever, however you're getting whatever root it would be. It is, it's, it's really unpleasant. I, I hate the small hive beetle. <laughs> yeah. keep it out for somewhat longer but also uh, we will have to learn to manage it once it actually does end up being here it will eventually whether it comes in in uh, licensed imports or whether it comes in through the back door or even in with something else and not actually you know with bees it might come in in wax it might come in with fruit we don't know um, so, you know, it probably will turn up eventually. But can I just do a quick straw poll? Who has bought a queen this year? No, just who has bought, let's start off with who's bought a queen? Out of those people that have bought a queen, so there's probably about 30 hands have gone up. How many of you know for absolute certain that it was bred in the UK. Okay, that's about half. Now, you know, there's part of your answer. In this small audience of people who are probably mostly members of the BBKA, you have people who've bought queens that have been imported. We don't produce enough in the way of queens and bees in this country for those that want to buy them. And while we don't produce enough, there will be imports of queens and packaged bees. So, uh, you know, in answer to the chap's question at the back, yes, it's making it more likely that small hive beetle will come in because we're increasing the risk by doing imports. Those imports are checked by us at the B unit, um, you know, of various kinds of checks that we do. But, you know, if you want to stop imports, then the beekeeping community has to get their act together in terms of providing what other beekeepers within the country want. Because if not, they'll go outside. Peter, I'll give you an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we really need to think seriously about this. this. This imports, I mean, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the US have stopped importing. It's illegal, it's illegal to import into the US, and I think that's the way this country should go as well because we need to get our act together and, and start breeding the indigenous stock. And, uh, because importing any livestock from elsewhere that's not uh, climatized is, is, is a race to the bottom of the barrel. It, it, you know, it's a non-starter. Yeah. We take, yeah, we take one more at the back. Hello, I've um, kept bees for the last six years and um, I've used small cell foundation as an attempt to uh, create a smaller bee to counter Varroa and I've been very successful. I've always made sure I've kept one or two colonies that are regular size, that are also untreated so that there's been a heavy Varroa load present. And over the last year, with the help of Reading University, we've undertaken some research to try and put some evidence behind this as, as opposed to my anecdotal statement. So I just wonder if the panel's had any experience or any views of, um, of this technique of using smaller cells, smaller bees well, uh, Tom, there's a lot of small cell in the States and the small cell foundation. Do you want to come up with this first? Yeah, there, it's, um, it's a contentious issue in, the, in North America. Uh, the evidence is that if you're working with European honeybees, there's no, nobody has found any evidence that small cell comb per se confers any 
um, inhibition of, of, uh, of the Varroa. It, there are people that swear by it, but they're confounding um, the keeping of African bees with, with using small cell comb, uh, because the African bees build a small cell comb. So people see that, oh, these, we have bees that are not having problems with Varroa, and they're on small cells, but they're African bees. Um, and so that, but they, it's the bees, not the combs. When people take European honeybees and put them on small cell combs, and I've done some of these experiments myself, we, saw, we see no evidence, zero evidence, of any controlling effect on the varroa. And if you look at, if you really measure it carefully, you find that even with small cell combs, I mean, the idea is that the small cells with the small cell combs, there's not enough space for the varroa to reproduce on the side of a pupa. Well, even with a small cell comb, there's plenty of space inside there. If you go through the measurements, you find that a, a worker, a pupa, doesn't use anything like the full diameter of, a, of a, even a small, cell, a small cell comb. And when I say small cell, I'm saying 4.6 to 4.7 millimeter wall to wall as opposed to 5.4 to 5.5. So I'm, I'm really... And I'm not, I'm not the only one that, that has done these experiments and gotten negative results. There's zero, zero experimental evidence that small cell comb controls varroa with European honeybees. Yeah, I just uh, want to ask the, the chap who asked the question, do you have drones in your colonies? And, and do you give them drone foundation? Okay. So mostly then, where you're giving them small cell foundation, they're making their own drone comb? Right, okay, so that, I'm just kind of leading you all here. The bees will make the size that they want. And I think, you know, they will work from the basis of the foundation you give them because that's easy for them. But if they don't like that size of foundation, they will change it to what they do want, which is evidence when they're making the drone cells, they want bigger cells, they make it that way. I just do things fairly much by you know, logic, and I think if the bees want something different, they'll make something different. So Tom's answered your bit about the research and the Varroa side of it. I'm answering it from the other point of view of what I see in colonies. And I'm sure you've probably all seen that whatever size foundation you use, the, the combs aren't always perfectly neat and tidy, and there'll be a few cells that are, you know, all a bit mishmashed down a line, and then they'll start again over on this side. <coughs> um, and I think, you know, some of them, they want a bit more elbow room than others, and it does just right. change. I think this it's gentleman it, it, here has it, it, been sorry? wanting. To, this gentleman here has been wanting to ask a question, yeah, okay. and the mic uh, wasn't well, able we, to we'll get to him. So, from Simon. It's, it's interesting. In the 1960s, there was a move to have bigger cell foundation. <laughs> Hello, uh, I keep my bees in Lincolnshire, and Tom, you've already uh, alluded to the survivable uh, colonies that you studied in the wild. Uh, got a wide genetic diversity. If we had a ban on imported queens, would that giant? Uh, uh, diversity with British bred queens uh, diminish somewhat and lead to something nasty? I think you've got lots of genetic diversity here. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, um, the honeybee is a remarkable, genetically is a remarkable insect. It has the highest genetic recombination rate of, of any organism known. That is to say, it reshuffles the genes on the, that are on any given chromosome by swapping between chromosomes. Um, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think you. I don't think you have to. The multiple mating by queens, the high genetic recombination. Um, there's a good mutation rate. I. I really don't think you need to import. You do need to bring bees in to have a diversity in your in your population especially since you've already imported and you've got a lot of stuff from different parts of Europe already. Well, okay, I'll say, I think I've got to close it there. Sorry, folks. Um, it was a little bit experimental. I think it's worked um, uh, pretty well. 
Um, we've had some really good questions, plenty of them, and I think we could probably get going this time tomorrow, but uh, uh, some, of, some of us need a little bit of sleep. Um, can I thank you all for your questions, and can I also thank uh, Meg Seymour, who I didn't mention was actually a master beekeeper, uh, Peter Jenkins and uh, uh, Tom Seeley. Thank you all very much. <laughs>